dispensationalists do not grasp the nature of God's promises to Israel. They fail to see that virtually everything about Old Covenant Israel was typological. It was a shadow. It was not ever the ultimate expression of God's plan. Dispensationalists fail to see that God had always promised that the Old Covenant form of Israel was to pass away, and she was to be transformed through resurrection into the new creation, the new man. Notice just a few examples of this. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 29 and following. God promised to make a new covenant with Israel. That covenant would give what Torah could not give, life and righteousness. Compare Galatians chapter 3 verses 20 to 21, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6 and 9:15. Is this replacement theology? On one level it certainly is, but it is replacing the old ineffective covenant with the better covenant. Is that a bad thing? Absolutely not. This is the best thing imaginable. Isaiah chapter 28. The Lord promised that he would lay the foundation of the messianic temple with the precious cornerstone. This new temple would in fact replace the old, but the change would be radical, almost beyond belief. The new temple would be laid on the chief cornerstone of the living Messiah. In other words, the new covenant messianic temple would replace the old covenant temple of marble, gold, and cedar with the living cornerstone of Messiah. This is the ultimate, quote, replacement theology, but who in their right mind would say that this would be a bad thing? Furthermore, keep in mind that it was the Old Testament prophecies that foretold this new covenant living temple. Isaiah chapter 56. The Lord promised that in the days of the Messiah the foreigner and the eunuchs who had always been excluded from Israel and the temple would be given a place within that kingdom temple. They would be given a name that was better than sons and daughters. This is a radical but patently true replacement. It would replace the exclusionary limited access to Yahweh with a temple that would, in fulfillment of Solomon's prayer much earlier, be open to all men of every nation. Isaiah chapters 60 and 66 the Lord promised that the priesthood would no longer be confined to the Levitical tribe, but that the time was coming when even foreigners would be able to offer acceptable sacrifice on his altar, he would make them to be Levites. So, is replacing the restricted, exclusively defined priesthood with the priesthood of all believers something to be viewed as somehow anti-Semitic and evil? If so, then you have to accuse Paul of that since he and John and Peter believed that the new priesthood of believers had arrived, and it was a good thing, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15, and it was in fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to Israel. Malachi chapter 1 verse 11 and following. God promised that the venue of worship would be radically changed, instead of one central strictly limited location where acceptable sacrifices could be made, Yahweh said the time was coming when men could offer praise to him in all places, that is any place, in John chapter 4 verse 20 and following, we find Jesus quote, commentary on Malachi and other Old Testament prophecies that foretold the messianic kingdom temple. His words were uttered in the context of the controversy between the Samaritans who revered Mount Gerizim versus Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. John chapter 4 verses 21 to 24. The importance of this text can hardly be overemphasized. Many dispensationalists believe that, beginning in Matthew 12, when Jesus perceived that the Jewish leaders were turning against Him, that He altered the kingdom plans. It was from that point onward that Jesus began to speak of the establishment of the church and not the kingdom. What Jesus said of the kingdom flies in the face of dispensationalism. Jesus was declaring that Jerusalem would lose its theological centricity. In the kingdom, Jerusalem would not be the geographical center of the world. Men could worship the Lord anywhere. To put this another way, the literal mountain of earthly Jerusalem would give way to the Mount Zion of the heavenly Jerusalem, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 21 and following. Now that is a quote, replacement theology, directly from Yahweh. Do you really think is that a bad thing? These are but a few of the old covenant promises 
that foretold the, quote, replacement of the old covenant things with the reality of Jesus, there are several other prophecies that anticipated, yes, the replacement of the old covenant, exclusive people. As we will show below, Yahweh had always promised to create a new people. Israel's day in the sun as the exclusive people of God would come to an end. He would create a new people with a new name in the new creation. Isaiah chapter 65 verses 8 to 21. So what we see is that the old covenant kingdom promises made to Israel anticipated that God would one day replace the old covenant form of those elements with the new covenant form. The new covenant and the form of those elements would be radically altered, bearing no resemblance to the old covenant form. What this means is that when the dispensationalists decry what they call replacement theology on the part of non-millennialists, but then they appeal to the old covenant promises of the kingdom, they are in fact ignoring the fact that those very scriptures foretold the replacement of the old with the new. The old covenant itself foretold the radical transformation of Israel and her world. Here is what is so critically important. The Old Testament prophecies of the creation of a new people were promises made to Israel. In other words, God told Israel all along that the time was coming when he would replace her as an exclusionary, limited, single ethnic people, with a universal people comprised of people from all nations. Now, since God promised Israel herself that he was going to bring an end to her exclusive claim to God and replace that conditioned state with an all-inclusive whosoever will people, based not on race but on grace, then it is a denial of biblical truth to say that God's eternal plan was that Israel remain his distinctive, exclusive chosen people. With this in mind, Let's take a look at just a few texts that anticipated a radical change in Israel's status as God's chosen ethnic people. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Genesis chapter 28 verses 13 to 15. In this often overlooked text, Jacob fought with the angel of Yahweh and prevailed. It is important to see that God reiterated the Abrahamic promises and pledged to fulfill them. Notice the incredible twofold promise one positive promise, one negative. The Lord said he would fulfill his promises to Abraham and his seed. That was the reassuring aspect of the promise. Yet, pay particular attention to what he says I will not leave you until. I have done what I have spoken. Here, God stated that he would not forsake Israel until he had fulfilled the Abrahamic promises. The promise that God would bless all nations through Abraham implied that while Yahweh would bless Israel distinctively for a while, the ultimate promise was that the blessings would be expanded. Thus, when he fulfilled that promise to bless all nations in Abraham's seed, singular, Israel's exclusive place in the sun was always intended to end. She would then, as all nations, have to find her place in the sun. This is suggested in another great text from Genesis. Genesis chapter 49 verses 10 to 11. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. This prophecy would be fulfilled in Israel's last days. Genesis chapter 49 verses 1 to 2. Many rabbis understood that this was both a wonderful blessing and a foreboding prophecy. They realized that while it spoke of the coming of Messiah, a wonderful blessing, they also understood that it meant the end of Israel's place in the sun, at least in some way, some fashion. The indisputable fact of history is that Judah, as a distinct tribe ruling over Jerusalem and Judea, ceased to exist in A.D. 70 with the destruction of the genealogical records. The scepter was Judah's authority, her rule, her sovereignty. That authority resided in the fact that Judah was to be the tribe through whom Messiah would come. Isaiah chapter 11. 
The irony of Genesis chapter 49 is therefore incredible, an interesting and important conundrum. If Messiah of Judah would come and establish the kingdom, the scepter, and rule and reign forever, Luke chapter 1 verse 32 and following, would this not be, at least in one form, the establishment of Judah and her sovereignty? Yes, on one level it would, but very clearly, Genesis chapter 49 is predicting the replacement in some form at least of the sovereignty of Judah with the scepter of Messiah. The solution is to be found in the indisputable facts of history and the realization that Jesus is Israel. He is Judah, but his kingdom scepter was not of the same manner and form as Old Covenant Judah. In other words, the nationalistic geopolitical rule of Judah over the house of Israel came to a catastrophic end in AD 70. But the eternal never-ending rule of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation chapter 5, was fully established. It is a kingdom cut out without hands, Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. It is a kingdom not of this world. It is a kingdom that cannot be removed or shaken. And just as Genesis chapter 49 foretold, compare Matthew chapter 21 verses 40 to 43, when the old covenant form of Judah passed away, that unending scepter of Jesus of Judah came into full bloom. Based on just these few facts presented so far, it can be seen that the pejorative term of replacement theology that is cast about by dispensationalist is misguided and ignores the biblical narrative. There is in fact a biblical doctrine of replacement theology, but it is not a doctrine of failure or postponement. It is a doctrine of God's scheme of redemption and His faithfulness. It is a doctrine of God's original intent being fulfilled.